A young child, I think most people expected me to become a rabbi. For a while there, in fact, I could think of nothing else that I would do with my life but become a rabbi. When I was in the fifth grade mock wedding, I played the role of the rabbi. And for a short period of time after that, uh, some people would call me Rabbi Junior. Do you remember that? Uh, believe it or not, though, I did not always want to become a rabbi. Uh, one of my favorite Shakespeare plays is Henry IV. While King Henry had fought hard to usurp the throne of his predecessor, Henry's son, Hal, spent years resisting his destiny to be the heir to the throne. My poor parents. <laughs> they knew how happy I would be as a rabbi, happier than I could possibly be in any other profession that I could possibly pursue. They knew my abilities, they knew my potential, and although I always tested well, my parents had to endure one mediocre grade after the next as I wasn't quite applying myself to my full potential. I spent one summer reading a year's worth of literature for my friend's AP English syllabus, but then didn't bother to find the time to complete the reading for my own class. My father sat on Rotary, awarding scholarships year after year to some of my closest friends, but never to me, my poor parents. <laughs> Though my test scores got me into a decent engineering school, it became readily apparent that that just wasn't the proper path for me. When they thought I'd be spending a semester abroad at Hebrew University, I think they were probably a little bit dismayed that I chose to take the whole year off living life on kibbutz instead. They were probably afraid that I'd never come back. After I returned and completed college, I took off almost immediately for the West Coast, over 3,000 miles away. My poor parents. <laughs> Knowing everything that I had to offer the rabbinic profession, I'm only just beginning to understand how painful it must have been for them to see me in such positions as moving furniture, bussing tables, waiting tables, bartending. I was even a bookseller for a period of time. They saw me dip my toe into the life of a paralegal briefly until uh, they saw me almost immediately reeling from that experience. By the time I settled down as an advisor for graduate students at UC Berkeley, they probably thought that was the end of the road for me. After all, it was a stable job. My son Ezra was on the way. And as my brother said, far be it for us to imagine that you had anything else up your sleeves. <laughs> In Henry IV, part two, Prince Hal comes back home. He goes back to work in the court. He serves his people. I'm no Prince Hal, but I showed up at synagogue one day in Oakland, California. I started teaching Hebrew school, and you know what? I discovered that I loved it, far more than my other job at UC Berkeley. I took a few classes at the Graduate Theological Union, and I was getting better grades than I ever had, and I loved, absolutely loved what I was learning. I enrolled at Hebrew Union College. I finally told my parents that I was enrolling at Hebrew Union College, and I enjoyed every aspect of my experience in rabbinical school. It may have been 10 years later, but I was finally attending college in Jerusalem. I was throwing myself into every class like I had never done before, immersing myself in Jewish history, Hebrew texts, prayer, and pastoral care. I served a number of student pulpits where I developed my rabbinical skills, leading services, delivering sermons, officiating at life cycle events, teaching classes, and loving every minute of it. By the end of Henry IV, part two, Prince Hal has long last become King Henry V. And I probably felt a bit like that to my parents when I finally, finally became a rabbi. Now, I think we all know the story of Goldilocks. She finds this house in the woods with three bowls of porridge. Uh, first one's too hot, second one's too cold, but the third one is just right. Well, fresh out of rabbinical school, I had the privilege to serve Hever of Southern Berkshire and Great Barrington. In those years, I grew a great deal as a rabbi, but the time finally came for me to assume the responsibility of serving my own congregation. 
My second congregation was Temple Sharei Shalom in Springfield, New Jersey, where I learned more than any rabbi should ever have to learn about the ins and the outs of the total rabbinic experience. I had the good fortune to serve some of the greatest people I've ever come to know, and a few other people as well. But at the end of the day, <laughs> at the end of the day, I knew there was a better place for me. In this week's Torah portion, Moses sends out 12 scouts into the promised land. Most of them come back terrified about their prospects, but Joshua and Caleb come back totally psyched about the land of milk and honey. Although my poor parents never saw this scout advance beyond the Cub Scouts, I have been scouting out Temple Shalom for years. Everyone knows that the Rosenberg family and the Koch family have been friends since Rabbi Koch and Rabbi Rosenberg first moved to Connecticut. So let's just say that Temple Shalom had been on this scout's radar since before I even became a rabbi. Even when I was living in Great Barrington, over five years ago, I was already inquiring, when is Rabbi Koch going to retire? <laughs> I actually called Rabbi Koch to ask him about Temple Shalom a few years ago, and he told me only the most wonderful things about the congregation, but he did mention that they were going to go with an interim rabbi for another year, so I had to wait that much longer. But a year later, the position finally became available. I may have waited a little while to submit my application, lest I appear too eager for the position, <laughs> but Temple Shalom was my first choice from the start. Just as it took Goldilocks three tries before she found one that was just right, this is my third, and I pray, final synagogue. Now, I've got to tell you, Temple Shalom feels like a perfect fit. Now, at, at the end of the Goldilocks story, this is where the analogy sort of breaks down. She, she basically gets run out of town. Uh, so don't do that, whatever you do, because I am personally having the time of my life here at Temple Shalom, and I hope that you are too. It's been one full year now, and I can't tell you how much I have come to love Temple Shalom. First and foremost, I look forward to seeing each and every one of you on every occasion. These are my people, down to earth, authentic, genuine, trustworthy, dedicated, compassionate, not to mention a great deal of fun. When we sing during services, Temple Shalom sings along God forbid I should sing the whole service solo. And when I teach classes, everyone has the most thoughtful, stimulating questions. When various committees meet to plan the future of the synagogue, everyone's voice is heard, every idea is good, and everyone treats each other with the utmost respect. When the board has had to contend with the greatest challenges facing the congregation, everyone is level-headed, and we all appreciate the value of consensus with a willingness to compromise for the benefit of the congregation as a whole. Every one of the kids in our educational program is brilliant, but what's more important than that is the fact that they're all really nice to each other, and they're nice to their teachers, and they smile when we come to teach them, and that is truly uplifting for each one of us who has the privilege to serve this congregation. New Milford is the kind of place where all the women are strong, all the men are good looking, and all the children are above average, as Garrison Keillor would say. But that's really an understatement. New Milford has got to be one of the most beautiful little towns in America. It's like the land of milk and honey to me, and Temple Shalom is like the Holy of Holies. Finally, I pray, it makes my parents proud to know that their son is at last at home doing what he does best among the nicest people in the world. Shabbat Shalom.